The Dr. Corey Richards. How does that sound? Getting uh, used to that? I'm still <laughs> trying to get used to it. Yeah. Uh, it's still uh, a little new. Uh, so good to have you on. Or well, this will be the second podcast that we've done. Um, I can introduce myself in the trailer episode, discuss what a movement professional is. If you want to do a little quick intro about who you are, what you're you're doing so far, and then we'll we'll get right into it. Yeah, so I'm um, Corey Richards. I'm a new physical therapist, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, but I've known you now for, I guess, close to probably five years. Yeah. Um, played sports all growing up and had my fair share of injuries, um, specifically some ACL tears that kind of threw me into the rehab world. And I fell in love with it um, playing lacrosse. And over that time, um, I got interested more in the fitness side of things as well. After undergrad, spent time as a strength coach and personal trainer in and around the Philadelphia area, and then went back to physical therapy school. And here I am now. So got yeah. through that and glad to be on the other side. And now working with people under movement professional with you in a one-on-one -on -one setting and have been loving that so far. Glad to hear that. But so that's actually like a, a good segue to like our discussion here. Like we wanted to talk about the bridging of the gap between rehabilitation and fitness. And yeah, you know, it's funny you say a new physical therapist, which legally you are, you just finished physical therapy school, but you know, I feel like you, you can kind of come at things from two different angles, right? Like, so you're newer as a physical therapist, but I feel like you have some good experience now on the, the fitness side of things. And when you came even you know, reaching out to me for observation, I just feel like you had so much knowledge that you were coming in with just because of your curiosity and your injury history that it's just hard to see you as like a, a new grad, although it's just, you know, that's what you are at this point. But that's sort of the idea about this bridging of the gap between fitness and, and rehab, like your your fitness knowledge I think already set you apart, even though you're, you're new in the uh, physical therapy space officially, but like all the work that you've done um, before that has really, I think, you know, set you apart and, and prepared you well for, for this process. You can disagree, but that's what I'm seeing so far from my perspective. I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's like when I started, I, I had, I enjoyed working out myself, but I really didn't have much fitness background. And I, as I finished physical therapy school, I started training kind of about the same time I started doing clinical work. So I was learning kind of on the job with both. Um, but I feel like you're coming in with a lot more of that fitness uh, experience. And, you know, you've done some great internships and just your your general curiosity. I think you got lucky with uh, who some of like your athletic trainers were, too. They seemed to be uh, good mentors and got you looking in the, into the right things. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think lucked out with my athletic trainer, shout out Adam, Adam Richmond at Dickinson, um, who just pointed me, I think in a, well, I think in a good direction um, of initial things to kind of look into training philosophies, principles to go by regarding both training and PT, or just more generally rehab. And thankfully, that got me eventually to the point where I got in touch with you. So I think having the fitness background has been really helpful for me so far, because in all honesty, I think of training and rehab as pretty similar in terms of we're just trying to move someone towards their goals. But it's just context dependent on what they're initially coming in for and what those goals really are. Yeah, 100 percent. And uh, you know, I think it's nowadays with how easy it is to learn for free in a way, like there's so much content out there. Now it's hard to filter that content and make sure that you're kind of getting content moving you in a coherent direction, but there is so much content out there. So if you have good mentors that can point you in the right direction of maybe their mentors or people that they've learned from, you could really learn quite a bit before you embark on a formal education. And like, that's one of the things I've noticed with working with students is, you know, some people come in with just better information than others. And some people are just like a blank slate. Um, you seem to have a really good 
uh, menu of information that you were coming in with that you you could work with. And uh, it's, I was, at, at, you know, as I got to to know you, I was sort of waiting for you to get done with physical therapy school because I was like, yeah, this this kid's going to be special because he's just got so much information, so much curiosity. So, um, but that's, that's the world. Like, I, I don't feel like I had that opportunity when I was before physical therapy school, there just wasn't all that information that was at your fingertips. Yeah. And I think that's probably, you know, I'd be interested to hear how you initially got into this space and started to tour to really honestly bridge the gap through rehab and performance. Um, because, you know, obviously that's a large part of our topic today, but we're coming at it from a different one different realm or different origin story, but also just different times where yep. I've had the ease of not to make you sound like a dinosaur <laughs> by any means, but like social media has been Mold. huge for her for mm -hmm. my whole time coming into this. Mm -hmm. And it's been so easy to get in touch with people and even, you know, even going to see people in person has been pretty easy. So just in terms of logistics, I think, and I'd be interested to hear how that sort of was different for you and maybe how that differently drove your, you know, destination to where you are now in the bridging the gap. Yeah. I mean, that's, it, it was, it was almost more of like a, an accidental experience. You know, when I got out of physical therapy school, I definitely had this distinction in my head of, okay, I'm a clinical physical therapist. This is what I went to school for. This is the job. And then there's personal training and fitness, and that's a different job. And it just surprised me how much like the two helped each other out as I started doing them more. But I really didn't have like an interest of saying, okay, I was going to eventually start a business that was personal training blended in with physical therapy. Like I really did think of them as two distinct things because that's just how they were pre presented in school. And, and a lot of what was presented in like the formal physical therapy education, at least when I went to school, was really trying to appreciate what your scope of practice was compared to another scope of practice. Like it was really important. Like you didn't want to overstep your bounds legally. So and I think and you got to do that because you don't want your, you know, that your students to be doing something they shouldn't do from a legal standpoint. But I think that the downside of that is it, it starts to really make these unnecessary barriers between professions and it almost makes things more competitive than they need to so like a personal trainer versus a therapist like versus a chiropractor they, they to me they should all be very collaborative and it's it's good when the lines are blurred um you you know make sure you know what you're not legally allowed to do but you want that to be a very like coherent collaborative environment and i think there was so much of that not being the focus in school that I came at things where it's like, okay, I'm, I have two very separate jobs. But then as I started working with some people that I had just discharged in a clinical setting, and then they became my clients from a personal training side, side of things, what you realize is like their diagnoses or their symptoms, they don't go away forever, right? So you might be treating them now in a personal training scenario where you're you're not you're sort of focusing on their whole body and just general capacity but they're still going to talk about their injury and, and we you have to figure out a way to work around it and and then you know you start to realize that the the symptom is just something that's another limitation in their strength and conditioning process so everybody's got limitations as they go through their strength and conditioning process whether that's strength mobility power, et cetera. Well, a symptom can become part of that limitation and you have to modify around that symptom, just like you can't force someone past something that they're physically not strong enough to do. Right. So it, it became just this accidental process of seeing where it's like, okay, like this, this is just another version of what I'm helping somebody out with, with their injury complaint. And, you know, it's, it's just kind of a, a different starting point. And then when you take health insurance out of it, it really gets blurry because health insurance really dictates a lot of what you see in a physical therapy clinic. And you don't necessarily realize it until you take it away, right? The idea of three times a week, the, the idea of like being discharged after a certain amount of time, that's a lot of that's based on like what you feel like you're going to get covered by insurance. And then that seeps into the, you know, the formal education process. But it's kind of arbitrary to think of it as like, why do I have to see someone three times a week for like a certain amount of time? Like it could be spread out over a longer period of time. You could be somebody's movement consultant, right? Like you, 
you're loaded with ed an education, but how you decide to use that education for your client becomes, you know, based on other factors. But a lot of times it's just built into what the healthcare system allows. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I always think of kind of coming back to what you were talking about, blending the lines and other, you know, taking the legality out of it and saying, mm -hmm. making sure you have that basis cover. But yeah. Craig Liebenson has always said, you know, when someone comes in to see him, he doesn't want them to know if he's a chiropractor or trainer or a physical therapist based on what he's doing. And I think that's a great way to look at it because in reality, it probably should look relatively similar with exceptions, whether it's, you know, you're seeing someone in an acute stage or something or in a hospital saying, but even then you're still trying to increase their overall capacity. You're trying to essentially make them a more resilient human being. And like you said, it's just a matter of the timeline along that really, like people are always going to have pain. I think it's 80% or something of people experience low back pain at some, some point in their life. So it's like, well, is that really like, it, it just becomes impossible, honestly, I think to differentiate it to the point that it's differentiated by insurance Right. And when you take into account that health is defined, at least in this country, as the absence of disease. So if someone surpasses that threshold, then they're going to lose coverage anyway. And that's, I think, personally, I think that's a far too low of a barrier to set right. for what is health. And that's why I think being in this setting where we kind of can blend the lines and or blur the lines, I should say. Mm and blend the two together, I think it ends up working a lot better in the individual's favor because it gives us more access to them. It enables us to work both through the things their experiences experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as around them so that they can continue to exercise so that ultimately they can continue to live the lives they want to live. 100%. And I think, you know, it, it takes time to make change with people, right? So like the, the timeline, uh, I think that's where once you step out of a, a clinic that's based on insurance, you realize like that the timeline was so arbitrary and unnecessary. Because you, if you work with people as a trainer, a lot of times you get to see them for, for years if, if, you know, if they're staying with you. And, you know, you, you get to see that like there's a there's a lot of health behaviors that you need to be patient with i feel like in um i remember my days in the physical therapy clinic i i was often impatient with people because i didn't even realize like subconsciously i had this deadline over my head as i had to discharge them in a certain time right so compliancy was was very important but there was also just this feeling of like well if you don't come in then you know we're going to have to discharge you because insurance isn't going to cover it because you're not being compliant. And there was no empathy uh, towards, you know, maybe that, that individual situation where if you are working with somebody over a longer period of time, yeah, I mean, you can, you can be more empathetic to them. You can be more patient with them. And, and it's often very necessary. Like we're, if, if we're looking at like what makes the, the biggest change in people, a lot of times it's, it's broad general things, right? It's like getting someone to just be, active, right? Getting someone to think about nutrition and change their their nutritional habits, getting someone to, to think about sleeping better, right? So these are all conversations that you can't overload people with right away, but they're they're super important in, from like a scientific perspective in the, the healthcare literature. So if we have time to build that relationship, then we have time to have people start to make these changes. And I'm often surprised like how long it can take to see some changes sometimes like I almost give up on a conversation and then i'll have a client tell me that they're they've made this change that they were doing on their own and that i had no idea or they'll thank me for something that i didn't even realize like they were seeing the value in right and it and that might be after three or four years of working with somebody so that's that's just something like the the timeline has really changed for me at this point the way it, that the, the business is run where it's just like you get to work with people one on one and you get to continue that care over a longer period of time. And it really makes it hard to 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 know like when you're a therapist and when you're a trainer and all that. But you're just you're a, a person helping another person. A lot of times you just happen to have the background 
that you went to school for and that you got educated for, but you're, you're really trying to help someone's overall quality of life. So I think like the broader the categories get, it, it gets harder to, to be a, like that specific professional. Yeah, absolutely. And like, there's so much out there sort of saying that these quick fixes kind of aren't the answer, but when you're in an insurance-based setting, mm-hmm. you almost kind of have to rely on them to a certain extent because you may not have the time you just described to actually be able to create some of those behavior changes, which are really what's going to move the needle forward in the long run. So yeah. that's where, like you said, having the sense that, okay, we have this educational background and this degree in and license, but that's not necessarily what's, you know, what we are doing every day in a certain, like certain period of time, because I, I mean, I kind of like to think of it as like, I have this degree, but it's not necessarily I'm using it for every single thing I do. It's just right. enables me to see people in a certain setting that I couldn't, if I didn't have that otherwise. Um, and like you said, it's just like, it can take years to really see some of the meaningful change And you touched on the behavior part of it, but I think also it's the the actual physiological change that you may need to see in someone can take months to years and having six to eight weeks or whatever it is based on a, just because someone's diagnosed with a specific um, pathology doesn't really, it's just, it's not enough to actually possibly see that meaningful long-term change and the behavior change as well. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think it's uh, kind of speaks to the idea of like why it's pretty well understood that when you come out of physical therapy school, you're not going to have a great strength and conditioning education, right? Like anyone who's in the strength and conditioning world doesn't really wouldn't really respect the education about strength and conditioning coming out of physical therapy school, because I don't, you, like anyone who makes a changes makes changes and goes through programming strength and conditioning knows that it takes time and they usually need more time than what you're allotted in a physical therapy clinic or a you know a plan of care so i just think it falls out of the educational process for physical therapists because it's like i, I know i can't fit this into what we're doing anyway so we might as well not even teach it to people until you step out of that model. And then all of a sudden you're like, okay, I can blend these two worlds together. And it might be more important that I get this person just like more physically fit. And and then all of the the pains and, and everything like that just get easier to deal with if they're just starting from a, a higher level of fitness. Um, and I've kind of got to the, the point now where I, I think like the two most important factors of someone having a better prognosis for recovery is just starting with a higher level of fitness in general, and then also having a certain amount of curiosity coming into a session, right? So those two really help someone's prognosis. And I'm sure you'll, you'll see this as you, you go on with like actually having like direct, like physical therapy clients, but I'm sure you already noticed it already. Like say if somebody comes in and they're, they have more fitness, like they have more movement capacity, they're going to be able to pick up the things that you want them to do a lot easier. But the other side of that being curiosity is that they, sh- if they're coming in and they really want you to solve like a very specific issue, they're not really curious about like exploring for themselves and really being their own experiment, then it tends to also get in the way of, of recovery because there is this constant N is one type of experiment going on where Here's what I'm going to start you with. I, w- I want you to play with it. I want you to learn about yourself through what we're doing here. And then that's going to help you be able to ultimately treat yourself. But then that'll put you into, you, like broaden your scope of what you actually add into your, your fitness regimen. So this idea of like just starting with higher fitness usually means that the person is more resilient to start. They're oftentimes less fearful of movement, right? So you you don't have to break that barrier down as much. But then that curiosity also speaks to that. So because I've worked with some really high level people that they're, they're coming in and they want to be better yesterday. And that also doesn't help prognosis either because they're, they're, they lack a curiosity of like trying to actually learn from the process. They want the process to be over so they can get right back to, you know, their, their high level function. So those two factors I find 
to be so important for for prognosis. But a lot of times you need to almost build that curiosity over time through time with people and and teaching. Mm -hmm. I love the curiosity piece because that's something I guess I've thought about but haven't been able to put into words. And it's so true because every exercise or every every session is really an evaluation yeah. of someone's current movement capacity and that's going to change day to day at least to a certain extent and then you add pain into the mix and it might change even more so the idea that you know you have this evaluation and that's sort of the only day you're kind of exploring things is i think not necessarily a helpful approach for patients to have um because it kind of sets the expectations that it's like okay they we found all we need to find to get you better when in reality seeing how the symptoms behave over a long period of time is going to tell us a lot more as we introduce all of these new exercises um and kind of test out what someone's able to do and i just think that curiosity piece is essential for that and like you said it's it's built over time because it's probably unlikely you're going to have someone on day one, especially if they're coming in in a fair amount of pain, who wants to really test all of these things out and risk putting themselves in more pain. Not that we're risking them or anything, but just that there's an unknown there. And it's kind of finding the positivity in the unknown, I think, that is, you know, what you just talked about, like, mm finding the positivity in the unknown um i think just will completely change the perspective that someone has coming into physical therapy versus being scared of movement and yeah that's that's just like such a long process that it can take because most people are at least to a certain extent fearful of certain movements they know when they're coming into us what tends to hurt them what tends to make it feel better so being able to form that relationship with them is just such a crucial part to what we do. Yeah. I think that's a good way to sum up curiosity too, is it's more of a respect for the unknown, right? Like, as opposed to like, I'm going to see someone, they should know exactly what's wrong with me. And then they should have like an exact protocol for improving. Well, like stuff doesn't work like that, right? If it did, like it wouldn't be a problem, right? Like if, it would be so easy in that nowadays if if we had all of that, like where we could just like point to this structure is damaged. Here's your protocol to make it better, right? Then you you would just go online and, and Google would actually work to help you, which it it doesn't, right? But but that's sort of like I think what there's an expectation there a lot of times, and to me that shows a lack of of curiosity. So always coming in with curiosity is really I have this constant respect for the unknown, and I'm going to try to learn more um as as i go through my own process right and i think that segues into this idea of like how how many different ways can you learn well one of the the ways that i think is the most important to learn when it comes to movement is to actually move right to actually do it and that's another uh, thing that i think was absent in the formal physical therapy education is like we didn't actually move that much like we we learned a ton about anatomy kinesiology um, and diagnosis and assessment, but we didn't actually do the exercises that we were trying to show people because there was sort of this assumption where once we figure out the diagnosis, the exercises don't matter that much or the, the ability to move well doesn't really matter that much. It's just we, we know what to strengthen, what an anatomical structure to strengthen and what to stretch. And like that's there, there was sort of this under appreciation for going through the movements yourself, feeling things yourself. So now you are a better teacher because you felt it in your own body. And that's where like for me, fitness has been that teacher for as long as I've been a therapist, but it's really blended in with, as I learn more from the physical therapy side of things or at, as a, from a fitness side of things, I'm not going to learn them well, unless I do them myself. So after taking a weekend course, like I'll get a an idea, but then I got to put that into practice by actually doing it physically. And only by doing it physically, do I feel like I can really feel any type of expertise to explain it to someone else. And again, it's, that takes time, but that also is just like respecting that this process of like, you know, do it yourself, lead by example so that you can 
feel like you can ex- explain something to it. And I, I don't feel like that's part of who a lot of therapists think they are. They don't, they don't really look at themselves as like, okay, I have to move to be able to talk to people about movement or to be able to help them get to a better place physically. And it's like, to me, that makes no sense. That's like being a basketball coach and you've never touched a basketball before. Yeah. Yeah. You, I mean, you got to have skin in the game, right? Like, exactly. Like, like you got to live it to actually feel it and understand then what you're asking of people, because if you don't feel it, then how are you going to know how someone's going to respond to whether whatever exercise prescription you 100%. give? Yeah, absolutely. But I think that's, that's the problem. There's this disconnect between the idea that like quality matters, but intent really matters too. Right. And I mean, there's some, some subtle stuff that we ask people to do, but we, we don't do it for no reason. We, we do it because we know like the difference between doing it one way versus doing it another way. Right. And we, and usually that comes from somebody's presented a model and then you're trying it yourself and you're like, Oh, that makes a difference. Like I was doing it this way. Now I'm doing it this way. And I feel I've gained benefit from this change, but you, you have to like play with it, right? Some people will just trust people with blind faith and just sort of regurgitate what they heard. Uh, I don't believe in that, <laughs> that model because you start, you know, you, you start realizing that you are limited in your teaching capacity. If you can't pull from some type of kinesthetic experience, especially when you're teaching actual movement, which is, you know, kind of the idea of what kinesthetics is about. Yeah. And I think that ties into, we always hear the story of like someone's told not to do X activity again, or they say their knee hurts when they're doing say like a step up or a lunge or something like that, like getting up and down off the ground. And to truly understand like what's required of that, I think you have to do it. And then you also, by doing it can play around with the movement and understand how can we shift stress to different areas to this movement and then then be able to instruct our clients. So maybe they perform a lunge, a squat, a step up, whatever it be, slightly differently. And now it's not like, oh, that activity hurts me. It's just when I do this activity a certain way right now, it tends to hurt. But when I just shift something slightly, I'm able to do this with much less pain. And I think we talk about the idea that like pain has a tendency to make our world feel small right because that's like all you can think about and Mm -hmm. by sort of showing you can do these activities maybe just not in the way you were doing them it opens starts to sort of open that world up again and i think that's really powerful for someone and maybe can't be quantified in any type of data or numbers but just talking about mindset it it really i think makes you feel a lot more hopeful for the future yeah, I mean, maybe you can speak to, you know, you, you've been a professional patient in your life, right? Like you had, what, three ACL surgeries? Yeah. And I guess that's really what, what got you thinking about this field. But what has your experience been with being a patient in physical therapy? And, like, imagine if you just stopped after your formal physical therapy as opposed to having some curiosity or having some fitness or, you know, continuing to to kind of look into things. What, what do you think the difference would be um, if you, you know, again, just had that really formalized physical therapy process? I don't think I would be a physical therapist, <laughs> honestly. Yeah. So, um, like, can you separate out, like, what you did in a physical therapy clinic versus what you have have found valuable, you know, for ha- what was your first ACL surgery? How long ago was that? Uh, 2015, 2014. All right. All right. So, it's been seven, eight years right? So in the last seven, eight years, like how much time did you actually do formal physical therapy versus how much time have you been working on yourself to try to improve your general capacity so that your ACL surgeries don't become a limiting factor for you? It's not even close. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, physical therapy, I was discharged at about six months after my first two and go figure. I actually, with each one, uh, because I did three consecutive times, first mm-hmm. two times, discharged six months, had another ACL tear. Right. And I just wasn't physically prepared for the things that I was asking of my body. But my like quad index, my jump scores, all the criteria that 
I think is kind of backed by research Mm -hmm. was, was good, but I just wasn't, it wasn't enough for what I was trying to do in terms of playing lacrosse at somewhat of a high level. And then actually my third experience was so vastly different because I found someone who was in kind of a similar realm that we are Mm. cash based practice where physical therapists and, you know, was, I think a coach long before becoming a physical therapist. And that was, I still to this day, like by far the hardest training I've ever done. Like I was, I was just crushed in a good way on a daily basis, but And then I came back and like, I was in the best shape of my life. I was running faster than I ever have, but that was just so much far beyond what was covered in a quote, physical therapy practice. And I was fortunate to have that exposure because that's kind of what opened up and showed me initially like, oh, there is a different way to approach physical therapy and fitness where they're not these real separate entities, but instead really one thing. Yeah. I want to come back to the specifics of of what you did there because I think that would be really interesting to to discuss. But just what you said about being in the best shape of your life, like I think that's something that it you know maybe it doesn't have to be that drastic, but it really depends on where your starting point is. But you're you're an athlete becoming in in the best shape of your life after an injury, right? Like when you have something that is chronic or is becoming chronic, right? Like say you have several injuries now and and surgeries now that's that's becoming a chronic thing you can't just get back to where you were and and hope that's going to be helpful like that doesn't exist anymore right so and that that's one thing that i've seen like most of the people we see in physical therapy have chronic conditions it's rare that we actually see acute conditions um depending on i guess the the setting that you're in but in more most outpatient orthopedic settings they've been in having a problem for long enough that there's now their doctor told them to go to physical therapy. So a lot of times we're working with chronic stuff that came on over time. And you think like you have to make someone better than they've ever been, not just get them back to where they were, because that was the problem where they were got them to where they are now. So you have to think of it from that perspective. So I think that's even from a, an athletic perspective, like a high level athlete, like you have to think about getting yourself better than you've ever been so that you hopefully don't have a re-injury or that you appreciate that because you've had that injury, you're not the same. So don't go back to to where you were because now your your knee is different, right? So you got to make yourself feel stronger than you've ever been. And that's that's the fitness side of things, right? Like that goes way beyond what you would just do in this sort of six week process of a physical therapy, right? And in a lot of ways, you you want someone that's a specialist in strength and conditioning at that point, and just to have an awareness of what your injury is, not somebody who's more dialed in and specialized on on the injury, right? So that's where the collaboration comes into play. But sometimes that could be the same person. A lot of times that should be more of a collaborative approach to, you know, like someone who's a specialist in, in working on how to get somebody actually really, really strong. So with that being said, like, what were the differences um you say you're getting crushed like what kind of exercises were you doing that you really felt were helpful compared to what you were doing in a more uh, you know kind of traditional setting that just wasn't enough yeah i think in the traditional setting it was a lot of i mean crush like all the leg lifts that you can do <laughs> did like a lot of sort of smaller level jumps mm-hmm. did some lunges did some things like that but like i wasn't sort of leaving I didn't really sweat a whole lot. Like Mm -hmm. there wasn't much load on my body versus the third time I went through it. It was like, I was doing single leg RDLs with like 225 on the bar. And then I would have to do like, I I mean, the amount of plyos I would do throughout a day, like little jumps Mm -hmm. at a session could be ridiculous. Like (laughs) just getting, because you need to get the amount of foot contacts that you're going to get playing a game. Right. And you know, whether it's like between that, between doing full on sprint work with sleds, between doing Nordic hamstring curls, heavy squats up to like 400 pounds. It's just like the amount of load that was put on my body that forced me to adapt and get better Mm -hmm. was just so vastly different. And I think that's one of the biggest things in a that a traditional physical therapy practice is lacking is just lack of load on the body like you walk into and sometimes that's honestly 
limited by like insurance because it's, mm. if someone's able to lift a certain amount of weight, then they're yeah, they, not, exactly. They yeah, they they exceed the needs, but mm. like we need to load people. Um, I think regardless of if it's a regardless of who they are, whether they're an athlete or a active adult or someone who has had pain is 80 and has had pain for, you know, 30 years now, it's like load is, I think, one of the biggest things, because if we're not challenging people appropriately, then we're not going to see the change and they're not going to be, as you said, better than ever before, mm-hmm. which is what we, we need them to be, because if they go back to what they were before, it's just going to mm-hmm. be a recurring cycle. Exactly. No, and I think, you know, you speak to like preparation there, right? Like you, the, fi- the fitness industry tends to understand what an athlete needs better, like from a preparation standpoint, where it's like, okay, this is, this is actually what load or intensity or volume would be appropriate for what you actually have to do when you get back to things. And I, I think ev- even when it like kind of looks more like fitness in a physical therapy clinic, there's just like a lack of understanding about what's hard and like what's necessary because you're so used to working with, you know, maybe people that you think are, are lower functioning. So doing a plyometric seems like such a step up from just having somebody uh, in a traction unit or on e that you think like, I'm really challenging that person. And it's, it's more like the fitness industry that actually really understands like what intensity is. And so that's, to me is like, that's something I've certainly learned over the years where it's just like, oh, like, I can actually bring in some of the stuff that I would kind of do with myself into the the physical therapy clinic. And it was, it was interesting, but it was also like, okay, now this is actually more therapeutic for people because I am finding like the load that they're actually appropriate for Like this, the idea of assessing somebody's limits, I don't feel happens a lot in, you know, or in when I was working in a clinic, I just didn't have the time to assess someone's actual like strength limit. Like I would just start them too light and try to progress them because I'm supposed to show that, you know, that I'm progressing every two sessions or something for insurance, but it would be like one band to the other where like it might take, you know, it, like I, I could have had them six weeks ahead already if I would have just taken the time to actually assess like what was like their capacity. And that's just something that I think is more standard in fitness. Like the first session you're, if somebody is coming in and they, and they have some history with a movement, well, you, you might figure out like what's your one RM, like what's your repetition max or something like that. And then you can take percentages of that and you're training them for more what's appropriate for that. That just, I never saw that in a clinic as something that was even like on the radar. Um, but if you are starting from fitness, like that's how you think about strength training, right? Like, so you, you can't really separate the two. Like you would, you would appreciate if you're not doing that, then you're really, you're making someone move against resistance, but you're not really doing strength training. So, you know, that to me is like the biggest thing that is like the, the blend there that is missing a lot of times from a physical therapy standpoint. And then what's missing, I think from the fitness standpoint sometimes is there's sort of like an, and maybe for a good reason, like an overreaction to discomfort and pain. Right. And because like if you're if you're not sure what to do, definitely a good idea to refer out. But where someone like you and I, like where we are sort of in both worlds, oftentimes it's not about, okay, like they're in pain. I know exactly what to do. It's just more like, hey, I've seen this before. It's actually not as big of a deal as it needs to be. Let's just kind of veer around it and stay the course. And I think that's the the biggest benefit, like from being a therapist when you're working in fitness, is that you're very familiar with the different presentations that are symptomatic that you actually don't have to over respond to them. Like you, you can just keep Mm -hmm. people into showing them what they can do. And then that speaks to this idea of like a a movement continuum, right? Like, so a movement is usually the, like some movement is what can be thought of as what you're trying to work on from a physical therapy, physical capacity, like functional standpoint And also tie that into a fitness standpoint. So teaching somebody or having somebody complain about pain with picking something off the ground, it can be something that you see frequently in a physical therapy side of things. And then some that looks kind of like a deadlift from a fitness side of things. And you see the two kind of come together where the continuum comes in is figuring out what somebody is ready for, right? So are are they ready for a barbell deadlift? Well, they might be if there's no weight on it. But maybe they're just need the movement without resistance, but it's still 
training the movement, right? So that's where it's like you can train someone who's 80 and has no fitness experience with similar movements that you train somebody that's a high level athlete. But it's just having this idea of turning the volume up and turning the volume down and having that mentality of a, a spectrum or a continuum of movement that I think to me is is what sums up this this blend the most. But there is and a part of this, I think, is this uh, kind of marketing strategy of trying to tell people that things are good and things are bad. And right? it's like, don't do this. It'll hurt you do this because I'm telling you to do it and I want you to buy something that I'm pitching. Right. It's it, like we don't have this mentality as much of turning something up, turning something down. It's more like an on off switch where it's like, don't do that because that that's going to hurt your knees. Don't ever do that again, but do this movement and this movement will save you. Right. So like, that's where I think that there is too much of a separation between fitness and therapy because we have these, these mentalities, these binary mentalities of like physical therapy exercise is stuff where you're lying on your back, right? It's really isolated stuff to, to work right around an area of injury where fitness is more complex, you know, it's, it's more full body where it's like, nah, it's, it's the blend is just like, you're both teaching movement. One just might have a better capacity to do it after there's uh, no symptoms. 100%. And I think like going back a little bit to what you said about being in the fitness industry, they, people tend to be and trainers and coaches tend to be better at pushing people towards their limits. And I think I've kind of, I think, in physical therapy, like being able to on an evaluation or even an exercise, like because every exercise is an evaluation, but mm -hmm. especially like in that initial session with someone, you know, typically like you're going to lay someone down on the table, take a look at some of their motion and things like that. But I've been finding, I learn a lot more about how someone's symptoms are behaving by having them do actually loaded movements because that's going to expose some of the faults, quote, faults, or just like different competencies that someone may possess. That's just, you're not going to find that by just looking at them passively. Instead, like you're going to see even loading them up on a squat and saying, okay, well, when does your knee pain come on? Or when does your back pain come on? And then how does that relate to the differences I'm seeing in your form as we increase load, I think that just becomes such a more helpful assessment, especially because people are moving without us on their own all day. Mm -hmm. And the table test may give, a, give us a idea of where someone is at movement wise and help us identify some glaring uh, limitations or things like that. But all in all, I think like that assessment of almost just putting someone through some type of session um is really like the best kind of assessment you can do for that person but there's obviously exceptions to that depending on who's coming in to see you um mm -hmm. but that's where i think like the only real difference there in that sense with an assessment with physical therapy versus the fitness realm is just are you trying to look at really the whole body or are you a little bit more biased towards a single body part? Yeah. Um, and I just think that's for me in practice, that's become so helpful. And my thought process in assessments now has just been, all right, what things do I need to see out of this person to actually get a really good understanding of how their symptoms are behaving and just giving them some exercises on the table after looking at a few motions isn't, isn't cutting it. I don't right. think, but yeah, I think uh, I'll I'll steal from uh, Charlie Weingroff here, where like he his whole uh, uh, curriculum is start at the finish, right? And that's kind of what you're alluding to, and I couldn't agree more. It's like you you want to see people doing the thing closer to what they're actually complaining about, right? And then you can, if they can't do that thing, right, which they might not be able to because they're coming in with some type of limitation, then you deconstruct that thing to what they can do but you don't start with something very far like too easy or because you think it's going to strengthen a muscle that might make that thing better right like start with the thing that they're complaining about because it it'll actually teach it, that there's a learning process to it right like here is what we want you to be able to do with this movement that you're complaining about but 
you can't do it exactly this way. So what can we do to make this just a little bit easier? So now that you feel safe with it, right? It either hurts yep. less or you feel supported in a way that whatever weakness was there is less of a threat, right? So you start at the finish and you backtrack, you deconstruct the movement, and then eventually you'll find what somebody is ready for. Sometimes that is changing a gravitational relationship, which means like if it's a standing issue, if it's a walking problem, if it's a where gravity is kind of loading on them a different way, well, then you turn them and you put them on their side or you put them on your back. But the idea is like you're trying to keep the movement in context all the time. And you want the the patient or client to follow that journey with you. You don't want them to just feel like you're just doing random stuff. But it actually, here's here's why we're doing this, because this is going to help you do the thing that you're complaining about. And I, I think, again, that just t- totally gets lost because... We'll, we'll diagnose a specific body part and then it's like, all right, we got to strengthen the muscles and the anatomy around it. But it's so it totally underestimates the learning process, right? Like no one's complaining about weak quads or weak hamstrings. They're complaining about like, it hurts when I walk. It hurts when I get up. So let's work on the things that they're complaining about and then make the, the fitness look like that with being just shy of what their problem is right and then what you start to see is it's very very obvious when people are making progress because you've started them just shy of what their limitation was what their pain complaint was they do that confidently they start to feel safe there the body adapts then they can actually do the thing that they first couldn't do and then they might be able to get beyond that right and now they're better than they literally are better than they were before they came in with the exact thing they were complaining about or as close to it as possible. So it just, it becomes like, to me, a more direct approach to getting someone better as opposed to trying to break it all down into different anatomy. The anatomy is there. Like we need to know it. We need to know how joints move. And we we certainly have enough of that education in our schooling, but it's, we, we don't, we never really learned how to put it back into the movement. Well, and I, I don't want to say like, there weren't classes where we learned that we certainly were, but it, it just was, it was sort of to me in the background where when you start getting into fitness and like, you're learning like how to teach someone a technique for higher, like barbell movements or Olympic lift, like wh- when things start to get more complex, your ability to coach that sort of like your ability to coach an athletic movement totally carries over to making you a better physical therapist because now you can take that movement and you can start to have an eye for it to say, okay, now I know what I want to do on the table with this person because I'm getting better at seeing like a more complex full body movement. 100%. It's just, it's really just attacking the problem that you're seeing head on as opposed to like, I, I think it's just never made that much sense to me when it's like, okay, someone has pain, doing like you said walking so it's like okay let's just go do all of these other exercises to strengthen the areas around the knee that you're having trouble with or strengthen the knee itself when in you know it's just a much more streamlined route and like you said easier to see progress actually and you're removing the guesswork from it when you just say figure out what is the hardest thing that they can do at that given time without surpassing their limitation so right it just makes a lot more sense and like you said i think it's something that isn't there's necessarily maybe there's not time for it to be taught like that in physical therapy because school's already kind of long but also like you said um previously if we're in an insurance-based setting then people might be discharged potentially before we get to a certain movement, if it's a barbell or something, but um, it applies to all areas of the movement continuum that you talk about. And it applies to walking, it applies to squatting, it applies to deadlifting, like whatever it is, It I think taking that head on approach is necessary. And that's not to say you're not going to maybe concurrently and address some of the real deficits you find outside the movement but i feel like as soon as possible we want to be plugging everything back into the movement that the person has had trouble with exactly yeah and and it becomes actually what they're complaining about right too i think that's like they they don't need to call it a deadlift or call it a squat like they they may not refer to it as that but they'll that's sort of our job to have a broad enough net to sort of hear what they're saying and say like i'm having trouble 
walking. Well, how how many ways can I look at walking and break that down that look, you know, maybe like a fitness exercise, but actually fit into what their complaint is. And then that's part of the the education process. Like I th- I think ultimately like whether we're in fitness or whether we're in rehab, like we got to be teachers, right? Like to me that's that's where we're best served, right? If we're coming and we're not motivators like if someone's coming in regularly like they're already motivated enough to come in like i don't want to yell at someone to to do more where i'm there i want to teach them something they didn't know like hopefully that's what they're they're paying me for is right to give them information that i've gone through schooling to get right same thing for you right so take this idea though of like just giving somebody exercises to like get something stronger and hope it's going to make some movement better just it disrespects the learning process like the motor learning process right like you have to practice something imagine if you you played lacrosse i played basketball right there's different muscles involved in a basketball shooting stroke there's different muscles that are involved in a lacrosse shot a lacrosse pass what if you just strengthen those muscles in isolation and never actually learned to practice the the shot right you would be terrible (laughs) at the sport like you would get no better at it you might get worse right so that to me is like that the equivalent right like if you're just isolating different muscles that are supposed to make the movement stronger but not actually practicing the movement in some variation then there is no learning that's happening and i can't see how things would actually get better yeah i completely agree and i think that honestly applies to the fitness setting as well especially in like a performance realm where well okay, let's say someone like in most field sports, speed is kind of the common denominator that a lot of the best players have. And it's like, Mm -hmm. okay, well, if we want to get you faster, we can either just practice sprinting at Mm -hmm. full speed, or I think it's sometimes too common to just say, let's, you know, get you a lot stronger and that's going to make you faster when, I mean, there's time for both, but like, it just makes more sense, I think, in the same idea and same thread as you were just talking about therapy to address the thing that someone is struggling with, whether right. they're in pain or not. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, we covered some good info here. And that, and to me, this is, you know, this is hopefully what this podcast is all about. Like, we are movement professionals, but just that idea of, of blending the, these two worlds, um, trying to bring some information about our experience in physical therapy school two different generations too like i think that's going to be very useful to kind of get your your take on it your you you've been your your schooling was probably better than mine although i loved the university of scranton i love where i went like just because hopefully things evolve with time right and i'd imagine uh there's probably a little bit more fitness touched on in in your education than mine and now the the continuing education world is really moving in that direction um but like we're we're doing it day in and day out. We're practice, you know, in a, from a very practical standpoint, bridging that gap. So that's what I want to have this podcast be really about is just the these stories about kind of blurring those lines and how to just look at overall well being from a perspective of don't profile any one professional as being one thing, right? Try to try to have multiple professionals that can help teach you to uh you know gain more competency with your your physical prowess but also just with your general quality of life all right so this was fun well i'll do it we'll do it again awesome later